stand together. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. Let's clap our hands today, everybody. Give him praise. Cause oh Lord, my God, when I in thoughts of wonder, consider all the world's thy hands have made. I see. I see the says with a shout of acclamation. Can we shout this morning? Ah, I said shout. It's like you're getting on to your children's shout, okay? Come on, let's sing it together. When Christ shall come, come on. with shout of acclamation and take me
Second service, good morning to you. Hope you're doing well this morning. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. Good to see everybody's smiling face today. Come on, this is second service. We don't have first service. You don't have your coffee and breakfast in Sunday school. Said it's good to see your smiling face, everybody. <laughs> hey, if you're visiting with us for the first time, or if you brought your mom with you, I want to say hello, mom. Uh, would you just turn to somebody that you might not know and just give them a big old warm welcome and tell somebody Happy Mother's Day if you would? Go find somebody and tell them Happy Mother's Day. Hey, if you're joining us online stream, we want to welcome you. Just go ahead and click the share button. We want to wish you a happy Mother's Day as well. If you have a prayer request, just drop it in the comments below. Follow a link to give online as well for tithes and offerings. So glad you joined us. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what
We doing all right today? Good to have you. What a beautiful day God has given us to honor our mothers. We want to welcome those viewing online. Uh, it's a pretty day uh, out there. I want to remind you of a, a few things. First of all, we do want to say happy Mother's Day. Hey, if you're a mother, will you stand? We just want to honor you today. Will you stand? All mothers stand. Yes, look at all the mothers we have. Praise the Lord. All right, you may be seated. All right. Well, we wanted to do a few things different this year. And, and one of those is we wanted to uh, honor all of our mothers with a, uh, with a gift uh, in, in uh, supporting a local ministry for women. And so take a look at this. Good morning, Bethlehem family. We wanted to do something special this year for our mothers. We wanted to honor all of you in giving and supporting a local ministry here in Laurel, Mississippi. Kim Gwinnett is here, and she's just going to explain some things and what's happening with this promising ministry here in our own town. Kim? So Missing Peace Ministry is a ministry that um, God laid on the heart four or five years ago he started. Um, and it's a, a ministry where we will be working with rescue missions. So these missions will go in and, um, and minister to or, or be able to, to rescue girls who have been um, taken captive or victims by, um, of human trafficking. So they will um, offer them a way out. And for those who, who choose to take that, they will then be sent to a detox for many drugs, alcohol that um, have physical withdrawals from. And then they will be sent, sent to us here at Missing Peace. And we will house those ladies. Um, these are women um, over the age of 18. And so we will, we will house them, they will live here. Um, we'll have house moms here um, to be able to just give them you know, 24-hour care, the love that they that they need, the love they've missed, and um, be able to, to show them, you know, how to love, how to receive love, um, just a healthy way of living. And then we'll um, be, be able to, we'll have people coming in to teach them life skills, um, just how to, to complete things, how to budget, um, all of the things they need, um, help them continue their education, maybe get their GED, just, you know, restore the things that have been lost along the way. Um, that's our plan. We're thinking it'll probably be maybe 18 months to two years here. So it will be a, a very long-term transitional living. And then we'll launch them back and we want them completely equipped. So when they transition back into life, they will not resort back to, to what they know. Before. Fantastic. Uh, as I said, that's an awesome ministry. I'm looking forward to hearing great things and news uh, in the years to come with this exciting ministry. So Kim, on behalf of the mothers at Bethlehem Community Church, we just wanted to present you a small token of our appreciation for what y'all are doing Thank here. Thank you, so much. Thank, right. you Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Happy Mother's Day, ladies. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ministering to women, I guess the older I get, the older um, my girls get, the more important uh, that stuff is to me. I'll tell you what happened this past Thursday. Uh, Annabelle had an uh, injury on the softball field. and We had to rush her to the emergency room. And while we were there, while we were there, the nurse took her back uh, for their initial x-rays and had asked her if she was pregnant. And... Uh, of course, uh, Annabelle uh, screamed at her and said, Do you know who my daddy is? <laughs> he would kill me. <clears throat> but uh, when the nurse came back with her and she explained uh, that to me, and of course she laughed at uh, her response and all, but uh, she said something that was very saddening. Uh, she said, It's become customary for us to ask girls of her age. Um, just a few months ago, they had a nine-year-old come in there that uh, was having some complications and come to find out she was pregnant. And, uh, and so, you know, I got to thinking, uh, man, it's very important, ladies and gentlemen, that we raise our little girls in the admonition of the Lord. And how important it is, uh, man, uh, 
we, we need to minister to everybody. And, and, and man, I, I'm, a, I'm a big contributor in, in, in building uh, strong men and all those kinds of things. But, man, I'm telling you, our young girls need to be, uh, need to be ministered to. Uh, and so I just wanted, we just felt the need this year to, uh, in, in usually what we spend on Mother's Day, I, I know we usually give away a keychain or something that many times won't even make it home. Uh, and so, but we, we wanted to use those funds and, and to, in honor of all of you, to support a local ministry in our area that ministers specifically to women. And so, uh, we want to do that in honor of all of you. Also, we have a photo area set up in the foyer, and we've got a special gift. Man, it's packed with cards. It's packed with all kinds of gift certificates, uh, lots of different things. And so here's how you qualify for that. You take a picture with your family in front of the photo booth there, and you tash, hashtag it, Mother's Day at BCC. Mother's Day at BCC. You hashtag that picture, and that will put you in the drawing. And we'll announce the winner tomorrow during our uh, recap video that we've been doing every Monday morning. And so you keep that in mind as uh, you leave today. Also, uh, this Wednesday, this Wednesday night, we, we won't have uh, regular uh, adult services like we usually do. It, it'll be our... Uh, grad night. We'll be honoring our seniors. And so that's this coming Wednesday night at 6.30. So you keep that in mind. Also, we got VBS coming up. Trust me when I tell you, it's going to be the biggest, best VBS we've ever done. Uh, we have put a lot of effort and a lot of planning into it. We are super excited. Uh, we host one of the largest VBSs in our area. And it takes an army and so I believe we have uh, roughly 70 or so volunteers already signed up. But we need about 100. And so we still got a couple of weeks. But if you feel led to help out in any way, there's so many different ways that you can volunteer. And if you haven't already, you can sign up in the foyer or see one of our children's ministers. Uh, uh, Tori or Kayla can help you with that. All right. Well, uh, if you're wanting to give today... We do remind you that our boxes are set up around the campus. You can give your offerings. Uh, you can lay it in one of those boxes, or you can go uh, online. You can uh, use the Text to Give app, or you can just go to our website and give that way as well. For those watching online, I will say this. Um, you know, it was uh, understood when COVID hit that a lot of churches probably would never start meeting again just because of the impact that COVID would have on a lot of smaller churches. But I'll say this, if you're watching us online and you attend another church, I encourage you, you send your gifts to that church. As a member of whatever church you are, you have an obligation to support that particular church. And we're glad you're tuning in and we, we're glad you are enjoying this broadcast. But you support your own church this morning. And so uh, we're going to pray. We're going to ask the Lord's blessings on the rest of our service today. We're here for two reasons. We want to honor our mothers, but at the same time, we want to praise the Lord. Amen? Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your presence today. Lord, we can feel you're here. We had a powerful first service. Lord, we're looking forward to this service as well, and we just want you to have your way. We want you to make your presence abound. We want to accept whatever it is you have to say to us. We want to lift our praises up to you. Lord, we ask for your will to be done in this service. And we'll be careful to praise you. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Let's stand together, church. Guess my mind. To Calvary, where Jesus bled and he died for me. As I see his wounds, his hands and feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. Are y'all ready to sing this morning?
go. His body bound and drenched. Laid him down. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. Let's praise his name together. Oh, praise the name.
together, Lord, just, uh, I pray you speak to every one of us in here. I pray that. Maybe somebody's watching online and they need this. Pray for them as well. God, we're nothing without you. You give us life. Sometimes I just think we just sing these worship songs and we don't really understand the meaning of them. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. God, I pray for a spiritual awakening and some of us, we might need that. Lord, I do lift up our pastor as he comes to share and teach this morning. Hey, would you just pray for your family this morning? You might be with your with your family. You pray for them. Pray that God would speak to them. And now pray for your heart. Say, Lord, speak to me. I might have been to church every time the doors open. Lord, soften my heart. God, we love you. In your name I pray. Amen.
Amen. Well, many times on days like this, I talk about uh, what a good mother you should be. Father's Day, what a good father you should be. And and we have these special days. But today, I I just felt led to continue in the series that we are in. Uh, It's entitled Prove It. And we're just talking about uh, evaluating our faith uh, and uh, discerning the fact that uh, is is our... uh, Walk like our talk, uh, and how all that looks and plays uh, into our life, and the importance of uh, of taking a deep evaluation of our faith and who we say we are as Christians. And so, let me just kind of revisit our theme verse, Second Corinthians thirteen. It says, "Examine yourselves." It's important, church, to examine who you are as a Christian, as a believer. Examine yourselves to see, why do we examine? To see whether you are in the faith. To see uh, how your faith lines up to what the Bible says. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Let's pray. Lord, we we love you and we just ask that you use this message for your good. I pray that you speak to hearts. I pray for those, uh, Lord, that need an examination of their faith. Or for those that, that are not fully sold out to you. For those, perhaps, that are sitting here that are not saved at all. I just ask that. That you move in a way to help them make the decisions that need to be made in their life. Lord, I know that that this message is for naught unless you empower it. And so I pray that you speak through me and use these words for the purpose of, of changing and speaking and transforming lives. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Heard a story about a passenger who had gotten in the cab and tapped the cab driver on the shoulder to ask a question. The driver screamed, lost control of the car, nearly hit a bus, went up on the footpath and missed a biker, scraped a fire hydrant, And stopped just three centimeters from a department store window. For about three seconds, everything was completely quiet in the cab. Then the driver slowly turned around and said, Listen, don't ever do that again. You scared the living daylights out of me. The passenger apologized and said, Sir, I'm truly sorry. I didn't realize that a little tap would scare you that much. The driver replied, well, I'm sorry too. It's really not your fault. You've got to understand, today's my first day on the job as a taxi driver. And for the last 25 years, I've been driving a hearse. (laughs) And so when you tap me on the shoulder, it startled me greatly. I guess that's the purpose of these series of messages Some of you have been going through the motions for years and years and years and years. And it's my intent for the Lord to shake us up a bit. To wake us up and to realize that if our life is not where it needs to be, we need to make some changes. It just to startle us enough to wake us up to help us realize that things need to change and need to improve When it comes to our Christian faith. In his book Crazy Love. Francis Chan gives a profile of lukewarm Christianity. And uh, he he shares. These are some some regular occurrences that he sees within the local church. And so 
Of course, we know that the Bible speaks against lukewarm Christianity. And the Bible tells us in Revelation that if you're lukewarm, that God would uh, spit you out of his mouth. And he'd rather you be cold uh, or hot than to be lukewarm. God, rather you not be a Christian at all, the Bible says, than, than to begin to play uh, a halfway Christian. And so this is what he says. Lukewarm Christians don't really want to be saved from their sin. They want only to be saved from the penalty of sin. God is a useful fire escape that they employ, not a God that they worship. Think about it. Does your salvation, is it based on your desire to go to heaven and to escape hell? Or do you truly, do you truly live on a daily basis where you want God to deliver you from your sins? Where you want God to, to help you to live a better life? Or is, is salvation to you nothing but just, hey, I'm, I get to go to heaven. I'm, I'm thankful that I don't have to go to hell. Is that all salvation is to you? If that's the case, you represent lukewarm Christianity. He goes on to say lukewarm Christians are moved by stories about people who do radical things for Christ. Yet, they never do any radical things themselves. Do you find yourself picking up martyr books? And picking up books about Christians who have achieved great things? Say, man, that's a... That's awesome. I'm so glad they had that kind of faith to accomplish those things for Jesus and, and reading the Bible and you're in all of that. But you never find yourself taking some risk for the Lord yourself. You never find yourself in sacrificing some things to allow God to show up in a big level in your life. He adds lukewarm Christianity equates their partially sanitized lives with holiness. But Jesus didn't call us to sanitation. He called us to discipleship. If you're his follower, your life will not be defined only by avoiding sin, but also by entering into his suffering. You're going to suffer as Christians. It's part of it. He goes on to say, Lukewarm Christians rarely share their faith with their neighbors, co-workers, or friends. Like Charles Spurgeon said, you're either a missionary or an imposter. When's the last time you were on the you were at work? When's the last time you found yourself just out in public talking about Jesus to someone? Not, not telling them uh, what has happened in your life when it comes to your family or when it comes to your job. And there's nothing wrong with that. But, but when's the last time you said, man, let me tell you what Jesus has done in my life lately? When's the last time you invited somebody to church? Genuinely tried to, to get them plugged into a church. When's the last time that happened? Do you find yourself just going through the motions? He goes on to say that lukewarm Christians think about life on earth much more often than eternity in heaven. He says lukewarm Christians do not live by faith. Their lives are structured so that they never have to. Do you live a life where you make sure that you never have to rely on Jesus for anything? Think about it. Do you make sure that all your bases are covered so that you don't ever even need Him? How's your faith ever going to be expanded? David Platt says, If you're not in a place where you feel desperate for the Spirit of God, then there's no way... You're on the front lines of the mission. Lukewarm Christians, he says, gives God their leftovers, not their first and not their best. He says, stop calling your complacency and apathy a busy schedule. Stop blaming it on bills and forgetfulness. Call it what it is. It's lukewarm Christianity. Now, we all struggle with these seasons of being lukewarm, where we are uh, striving in certain areas to maintain the same commitment that we once had with Christ. Church, I go through it. 
It happens to all of us. We go through these seasons where we're just not as committed or, or don't have the exact same desires as we once had. That comes and goes. It happens. But to allow, to allow your life, some, some Christians never have the desire at all. Some that say they're Christians anyway. There's nothing at all about their life that represents what the Bible says about being a follower of Christ. Hebrew writer tells us this in Hebrews 3, 12 through 14. It says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original convictions firmly to the end. You see, the purpose of this series is to encourage us to examine ourselves. Listen, I, I'm not sharing all this stuff in the last several weeks for you to question your faith. I'm not trying to fill you with doubt. Well, am I, am I really a Christian or am I not a Christian? No, that's not my intent. My intent is to encourage you to have confidence in your faith. You see, if you're a follower of Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, you shouldn't ever doubt whether you're a Christian or not. You should never be confused. Well, maybe I'm not sold out. Maybe I am. No, no, no. You know if you're sold out or not. You know if the Holy Spirit's living in your life or not. You, you know whether you have a relationship with God or not. And, and so, but the Bible speaks of things to help us point to say, well, uh, no, no, no. A Christian looks like this. Because many times what we've done is we've watered it down so much that people have done some Christian things, but they're still confused about their Christian life. They're still confused whether they're saved or not. And I'm here to tell you, you shouldn't be confused about that. You shouldn't be doubtful when it comes to your salvation. Now, this examination is, is, that we're talking about is really just a test of fellowship. I mean, you know whether you have a relationship with God or not. You know whether or not if you're walking in the Spirit. Hey, trust me, I, I'm telling you, we serve a God that, 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 that you know that you know Amen. when you have a relationship with Him. You don't have to imagine it. And so I want to give you some things. And we're going to move to, to 1 John. That's where we want to camp out. And 1 John tells us some things. Of, of Just kind of lays it out there to us. Of what being born again and what being saved, what it looks like. Now let, let, me, let me kind of set the stage here with verses 1 through 7 of 1 John chapter 1. I don't have these verses on the screen, but let, just follow along. It says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and now has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. It says, we write to you, to make our joy complete. This is the message that we have heard and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. And if we claim to have fellowship with him yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. So how do you know that you are walking in that fellowship? Well, like I said, you should know, but, but, but the Bible tells us, 1 John lays out some very specific things that you can use as an evaluation of your life as a Christian, of, of you being born again. Number one is this. How can we know? We can know if we strive to keep His commands. If we strive to keep His commands... 
It's in verses 3 of 6 of John 2, or 1 John 2. It says, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. You see, listen, if you're a Christian, if you've come to know Jesus as your Savior, one of the things that's, that, that makes that evident, that, that gives proof to that, is that you desire to obey what the Bible says. You have a desire to live for him. Listen, I'm not telling you you're not going to make some mistakes and you're not going to fall every once in a while. But, listen, if you continue to have a potty mouth over and over and over with no, with no fear or, or no feeling at all to want to change, if you continue to look forward to the weekend that has nothing to do with church and God, if you continue to live your life solely based on the things of the world and you never have no desire to live up to the Bible standards, I'm telling you, you need to evaluate whether you're born again or not. Because according to the scripture, that if you're, for those that are born again, they have a desire to strive to keep his commands. We strive to keep his commands. Commandments. Later he goes on to say that if you know that he's righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of God. And so we strive to keep his commands. Are you striving to obey God's commands these days? Is it important to you to do what the Bible tells us to do? Secondly, how can we know? We can know if we strive to know the truth. If we strive to know the truth. I don't want to camp out long here because we have, we've hit on this, uh, on all the messages because it's that important. I mean, the Bible constantly tells us the importance of being involved in the truth. And that's something that our world needs to hear. You see, it's not just good enough to, to strive to keep his commandments, but man, we, we've got to know that the will of God I- includes living by the truth. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 10, Paul says that the wrath of God was going to be poured out on those who were deceived because they did not love the truth. You see, there are a lot of people who love Jesus enough to go to heaven But they don't love the truth enough to live for Jesus. And so you say, what's the result of that? You got a lot of lying, backstabbing, gossiping, drama-filled churchgoers who believe in Jesus but do not live by the truth. And if that's you, let me remind you that the Bible says that even the demons and the devil believe but they tremble. You see, it's not enough just to believe. You've got to have a desire to strive for the truth. There are so many people that live their life based on lies. And they allow themselves to constantly get called up into the lies of the world. Is it important to you that you know the truth? Is it important to you to live by the truth? Or do you find yourself getting caught up in gossip all the time? Think about it. It's important. I'm telling you, as a Christian, when we hear nonsense, we have this deep yearning to say, man, I don't know if that's true. I, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. First of all, because it may not be any of your business. And second of all, because we don't know if it's true or not. But it's so imp- isn't it amazing how we are so apt to share a lie Instead of share the truth, I guess the truth is boring. I don't know. What is it? It's amazing how we how we shudder and how we're so fearful to 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 share the good news of Jesus Christ. But how easy it is to go talk about some gossip that we've heard about. How can we know? We strive to keep his commands. We strive to know the truth. 
Let me give you these verses and then we'll move on. First John 2, 18 and, and 21, it says, Dear children, this is the last hour, aren't we? We're in it. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. And this is how we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. That's the separator there. I did not, or I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie comes from the truth. Okay, number three is this. You have to strive to keep his commands. You have to strive to know the truth. How else do we know? If we, if, if we embrace our hope. If we embrace our hope. See, even if we strive to keep his commands and even if we strive to, to know the truth, there's still more. John 3, 1 through 3, it states that see what great love the Father has lavished on us. That we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we will be has not yet been known. But we know that when Christ appears, he shall be like us, for we shall see him as he is. And we have this hope in him. Purify themselves just as he is pure. In other words, if you're a Christian, if you're living your life for the Lord, there's this hope that, that swells up within you. Because, not because you've got the cars you want, the houses you want, all the bells and whistles. No, no, no. But because you're a child of the king. Because you're a child of the living God. There's just this hope within you. I, I, I'm telling you, man, there's, the Bible speaks against this, this idea of, of Christians walking with their head down all the time. Uh, constantly depressed and, and down and negative and drama filled. Man, hey, as a Christian, there should be this hope within you that just puts a smile on your face despite the things that may be happening wrong in your life. We, we should be hopeful. Man, are you, are you hopeful these days? Or is your life driven by negativity and gloom and doom? Number four. How can we know if we love each other? Hello. Huh. If we love each other. You see, it's not enough to strive to keep his commands, to strive to know the truth, to embrace our hope. But John says, hey, you, you are to love each other. Because listen, there are a lot of people who, who tried their best to, to be as good as they can, uh, to, to, to know the truth and, and all this stuff, but they're terrible with people. You can tell there's no love. for, for Listen, as a Christian, this irritation we have with people should not be there for those that love Jesus. I, you're not going to jihad with everybody, of course not. But this love for each other is something that separates Christians from others. It's in verses 18 and 19 of John 3. It says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in His presence. What's another way that, that you know? Is, is, is how you treat people. How you love each other. Number five. Last one is this. How can we know if we suffer for the cause of Christ? If we suffer for the cause of Christ. First Peter 1, 6 and 7. That's what it says. It says, in all this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while. You may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. 
These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. In other words, you, you, you're going to face trials. You're going to face tribulations. You're, you're going to face some sufferings. Philippians 1, 28 through 30 goes on to say this. It says, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved. What's the sign? Here it is. And that by God, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ that not only to behave or to believe in him, but also to suffer for him since you're going through the same struggle you saw I had. And now hear that I still have. Hey, listen. I hear all the time, man. People get so mad when somebody talks about them. Man, I'm trying to be a Christian. And they're, they're saying bad things about it. Who cares? Who ca- hey, this is, this is interesting because I, we don't use that same principle in the worldly uh, sphere. Here, let me give you an example. You have a, you have a, a, a ball team that's whipping and, and just kicking everybody's tail. They, they, they win. And then everybody starts talking about them. Oh, man, that team is, they just want to blow out everybody. What do we do? We take pride in that. <laughs> we don't go say, man, I can't stand them talking about us. They should, no, no, no. We like, they just mad because we whooping them. <laughs> right? Hey, we, we don't care about that, do we? Because we know, we know what we got. We know who we are. Right? Why do we get so bent out of shape when somebody uh, talks about us as a Christian? So be it. Know who you are in Christ. Know what you are. And and rejoice in that. Because the Bible says that you will face those trials as a Christian. Listen, ladies and gentlemen. Your proof of progress in this world has nothing to do with what you receive, the blessings and all the, all the uh, accolades that come along your way. That's not proof that God is doing something in your life or that you have a relationship with him. Man, many times uh, people come to me and they say, man, uh, I just got this and some money just came in. and Man, God's still on the throne. And I'm like, man, I'm glad God did that for you. But the truth is, whether you got that or not, God's still on the throne. God's still on the throne whether we get anything or not. And so, one of the proof of of you being a Christian is that you are going to suffer. You are going to face some trials and tribulations. Man, that comes with the territory. One story and I'm done. Years ago I heard this story uh, interesting about a group of, of, uh, of guys who all received uh, large, very large inheritances. And they were all good buds. And man, they just said, hey, we ain't never got to work again. Hey, let's just travel the world. Let's just have fun, do whatever. And so they came up with this bright idea. One of the guys says, hey, won't we, won't we all split up? All corners of the world. Let's see if we can find the greatest thing that the human eye can ever see. You know, just that most beautiful thing, wherever it is, let, let's go look for it. And so they did, man. They split up. One guy went to Europe. One guy went to the Americas. One went to uh, Africa. One went to Australia. And they, they just split up in all these places. And, and they just, uh, start looking. And, and one guy, he's in England. Walking the streets of England, and he comes across this huge monastery, big monastery, a place where monks live and they dedicate themselves to the Lord. And outside of this monastery is a huge sign on the lawn. And the sign says, Inside, you'll find the greatest thing that the human eye can ever see. And you can imagine, he's like, That's like verbatim what we've decided to do. I mean, what, what we're looking for. He says, I gotta check this out. And so he goes and he knocks on the big doors of the monastery. Monk comes to the door and the guy says, Hey, I just happened to notice your sign outside. Hey, I'm looking for that. In fact, I've got a group of friends that are looking for that. They're not with me now, but I just, can I see this thing, whatever it is? And the monk says, Well, you can, but you can't right now. You see, you have to become a monk in order to see it. And so, you know, he's not thinking 
what all that entails. He's just like, hey, that's, I, 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 I committed to finding this thing. Obviously, this is it, and so I'm going to do it. And so he goes in, and, and he says, okay, what do I need to do to become a monk? The guy, guy says, well, the first thing you need to do is you need to go to that room, and, and you need to spend an entire year in solitude praying to the Lord. Seeking what he would have you to be and all that. And, and so uh, he says, okay, I, I'll do it. And, uh, so as you can imagine, halfway through, I mean, he's like, oh, man, this is too long. But, he, you know, he just, he presses on. He, the year's finally up. And, and so he gets in front of the council. He says, okay, can I now see this greatest thing the human eye can ever see, whatever it is? And they said, no, the next thing you need to do is you've got to memorize the entire Old Testament. And he's like, oh, my goodness, that's going to take forever. I've already been here a year. I, I, my friends probably think I'm dead. Ain't no telling where. But I, 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 I'm already here. I might as well do it. And so he did. It took him about seven months to memorize the entire Old Testament. He quotes it in front of the council. And the council says, okay, now you need to memorize the entire New Testament. He's like, oh, man, this, this is never going to end. He says, okay, I've done been too far to quit now. And so it takes him about five months to memorize the entire New Testament. And he quotes it in front of the council. And he's like, man, I hope this is enough. Can I see this thing? I've been here forever. And he said, well, there's a, there's a golden door over there. You see it? You go through that golden door. And there'll be a secretary sitting there who possesses a key to a larger golden door. And so he says, okay. He goes through and... And the uh, secretary says, yes, I've been waiting for you. She pulls out a stack of papers like this. It was papers that he had to go through and he had to read all of it and lots of stuff he had to sign. And so, man, it takes him several weeks to go through all of it. Uh, it was just a ton. And so he finally, he's done and he says, now, can I see the greatest thing that human eye can ever see? And she pulls out the golden key to the golden door. And she says, go unlock that door and you'll find the greatest thing that the human eye can ever see. And so he unlocks the door and he just falls to his knees. It truly was the greatest thing that he could ever imagine. The greatest thing the human eye can ever see. Surely his quest was over. And so... He goes and he gets his friends. He says, listen, I ain't got time to explain all of it. It's going to take a process. I can't tell you what this is, but you've got to become a monk to see it. I promise you it's worth it. And so they all go to England and, and they go in the monastery and they go through the same process. And just like him, they felt like giving up several times, but they, they, they pressed through. And, and when it was all over, they were given the same golden key to the same golden door. And they open it, and their reaction was the same. They just fall to their knees. It truly was the greatest thing the human eye could ever see. They just they couldn't imagine their eyes. It was just that special. And so you know what they saw, ladies and gentlemen? I can't tell you because you're not a monk. <laughs> Man, that's frustrating, isn't it? You waited all that for, to hear what it was. <laughs> hey, listen to me. Listen to me. I'm closing. Listen to me. <laughs> listen. I lived half my life, half my life, doing what everybody said for me to do. Uh, you, you need to do this to be a Christian. You need to live this way. You need to live the way. But I was never happy, man. I didn't understand what everybody was talking about because I did everything they told me to do. And, and to me, there was no advantages at all to the Christian life. All I knew that I was staying home while they were out rambling and having a good time. And, and, and I, I never realized what was so great about being a Christian. And then, man... People tried to explain it to me, but it never made sense. And then, man, there came a time when I, I fully sold out to Jesus. I fully surrendered everything to him. And, man, it was that time that, man, there was a calm and peace. That when the Bible talks about, man, a peace that passes all understanding, I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that's the truth. 
That's the truth. I don't care what anybody tells you. There's no way you'll ever know the goodness of God until you experience it yourself. Nobody can ever explain it to you. I can get up here and tell you how good God is and what he can do and that he truly will supply your needs. But you won't ever know it and believe it until you give him the chance. Until you say, okay, I am going to sacrifice. I am going uh, to put some things out there to fully rely on the Lord. I am going to take some risks. God, I am going to give you everything. I'm going to give you the opportunity to say who, to do who you say that you are. Until you do that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, you won't ever know the goodness of God. But if you will... If you will, you won't ever doubt who God is in your life. You won't ever doubt the greatness of our God ever again. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. and Thank you for this time. And Lord, I just ask that you have your way at the conclusion of this service. Speak to us. Move us. Encourage us to make decisions for you. With every head bowed and eyes closed. Whether you're sitting here or you're listening online, you say, Pastor, I, I don't know Jesus. I've never been saved. There's nothing evident about my life that represents being a Christian. And, and I, I just I know that I'm not saved. You say, man, I've, I've been through some of the motions and I've done some things here. But the truth of the matter is, I've never had a born-again experience with God. But today, I'm ready to do that. Today, I'm ready to give my life to the Lord. Hey, if that's you, whether you're sitting here, whether you're listening online, you say, I I'm ready. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And, and it's the intent of the prayer. It's not the prayer itself that saves you. But man, if you're serious, today's the greatest day of your life. You pray this to yourself. You say, Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. And I believe that you died for my sins. I also believe that you rose from the grave to conquer death, hell, and sin. Today, I commit my life to you. And I accept your forgiveness for all of my wrongdoings. I ask the power of the Holy Spirit to help me to be the person that you want me to be. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, I pray. No one looking. No one looking. You say, Pastor, I prayed that and I meant it from the bottom of my heart. Could I see your hand? You just slip it up gently. You say, today, I prayed that and I meant it. Just slip it up so that I can see it. If you're listening online, you say, I, I prayed that, Pastor, and I meant it. Hey, you just type these four words in the comment section. I prayed that prayer. That's all, that's all we need. I prayed that prayer. We'll be sure to contact you and help answer any questions that you may have. All right, we're all going to stand. We're all going to stand. This morning in the early service, a lady came up to me and she said she'd been dealing a couple of weeks with some things and just realizing, uh, man, she's been to church for a long time. She's been going through the most. She loves the Lord, but she just realized she's never truly surrendered her life to Jesus. And wanted me to know that he, she just gave her life to the Lord. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, this life, this life is too, long, it's too short, way too short, way too hectic to be wrong with God. It's, it's miserable enough broken, it's sinful, it's evil if 
you're not right with the Lord, I, I pray. I pray that you, you do that. Maybe you've been living. Maybe you've been saved. And you just realize, man, I, I, I'm just not where I need to be. I'm just not where I need to be. I, 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 I've been holding back. I've been going through the motions. Uh, man, I, I've given my life to the Lord, but there's so much of God that I, I, I would like to experience. Perhaps you, you just haven't given him a chance to get to you in those deeper levels. As we sing, for whatever reason, you want to come respond, you, you do that. Thank you so much for joining in on our services today. If you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior, or you would like prayer, or you'd just like some more information about our church, please email us at the email address at the bottom of your screen. We look forward to hearing from you, and may God bless you, and we hope to see you next week.